John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And it is that last phrase, that magnificent phrase, that incredibly gracious phrase, Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Father, we thank you that you love this world and you gave your only begotten son. We thank you, Jesus, that in a way you, you love the creatures that you have made. We thank you, Lord, that you love all mankind. But we thank you, Lord, that you have a special love for your own. And we thank you, Lord, that if we are born again, then we are your own in a way that many are not. And we thank you, Lord, that having loved your own who are in the world, you've loved us to the end. Lord, your word says that in this world we will have tribulation, but to fear not. We thank you that you have overcome the world. And we thank you that you have a special love for your own who are still in this world. A special care. And that you will love us to the end. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This verse in chapter 13, verse 1 of John's Gospel be begins what I believe is one of the most magnificent portions of Scripture that we will find in the Word of God. John chapter 13 through to 17, they are the final words of Jesus to his disciples before the cross. That Jesus' final message to his disciples. Now we cannot put one scripture above another scripture. Uh, that is a huge mistake. But at the same time, I think we can declare that in his last conversation with his disciples, in his last words with his disciples, Jesus did not wish to speak about incidentals. That he didn't want to speak about things that were not important, but that his last and final words to his disciples before the cross would be words of tremendous significance both to the disciples and to the church who would come after us. That's why it is a wonderful portion of Scripture. These five chapters in John record the last moments of Jesus' fellowship with the disciples before dying on the cross. So how did Jesus use this time? What were the final words that Jesus said to his beloved disciples? I think we can sum up the content of Jesus' final words to his disciples with this one verse. Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And these words of Jesus are made even more beautiful and precious to us when we remember the occasion on which he spoke then. We also read in this verse, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world. So we know the occasion. We know what Jesus knew. We know what had been revealed to him. He knew that his hour had come. He knew that his time had come. The cross was now imminent. This was his last opportunity. But instead of thinking about his own sufferings, instead of thinking about his own death, instead of thinking about himself, he spends these last moments with his disciples thinking about them, loving them, teaching them, thinking of them. If ever there was a time where we would think our Lord would think of himself, 
where he would think of his own situation, where he would say to his disciples, you know, I'm, I'm very, very troubled. No, he waited until he was alone with his father in the Garden of Gethsemane when he really said, my soul, is in agony. If there is any other way, Father, then let this cup pass by me. He waited until he was alone with his Father before he declared anything about his own feelings. This is the love of Christ. This is the love of Jesus. This is the love that draws us. This is the love that brings us to God. This is the love that brings us to one another. It's this sacrificial, all-consuming love that Jesus has for his own. Jesus knows that very, very soon he will be gone and they will be left alone without him. And he's very aware of the disciples when he's gone. And John describes in these chapters how Jesus, who had always loved his disciples, now shows his love to them in a very special way. And the question we, we ask today is, 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 am I his own? Are you his own? Are, are we his own? Do we belong to Christ? Because if you are his own, then you are the special object of Christ's love in a way that others are not. You are his own. Given to Christ by the Father. All that the Father has given me. And Jesus says that he will not lose one of them. You are his own, purchased by the blood of Jesus. These are fundamentals. These cannot be compromised. You are his own, chosen and called before the foundation of the world. See how much God loves us. That you were chosen in Christ before the very foundation of the world. That's how you, much you mean to God. That's how important you are in the eyes of God. Not that it should bring pride, it should bring humility. Not that it should bring arrogance, it should bring absolute humility. To know that he's chosen you. He set his love upon you. You are his own purchased By the blood of Jesus. You are his own called and sealed by the Holy Spirit. You are his own a a blessed member of the church of Jesus Christ. You are his own a blessed child of God standing in a closer relationship to Christ than the angels of heaven. Because which angel of heaven has the same gratitude the same thanks as a fallen man or woman who is saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ simply because God loves you. Simply believe a sovereign God chose to place all his love upon you. You are loved with an absolute love. We love with (laughs) inabsolute love. It's, it's never perfect. It's never full. But God loves us with an absolute love. He cannot love you any less because he wouldn't be God. He cannot love you more because he wouldn't be God. His love is like everything else. It is absolute. As is his holiness, as is his justice, as is his righteousness. But you are not just his own. John describes you in a special way. You are his own who were in the world. Or as we can say today, you are his own who are in the world. And God has a very special love for his own who are in the world. Jesus has many, many who were in the world and are now in glory. The apostles the early church fathers, men and women throughout the ages who lived and loved and were loved by God 
who was saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and they've gone on to glory. And God's love for them is, as I say, it can never be less, it can never be more. Whether, whether we go to glory today or whether we go to glory in ten years' time, his love doesn't change. But he has a, a, a special love for his own that are in the world because the ones that have gone to glory are protected in a way that we are not. The ones that have gone to glory do not have the difficulties and the problems and the discouragement and sometimes the disappointments of this wonderful Christian life. Oh, I have to, I have to qualify that. It is a wonderful life. But uh, unless you are doing a lot better than me, uh, it is not without its troubles. In the world, you will have troubles. But he has a very, very special love for his own who are in the world. Why? Because we are facing daily the problems of this life. We are daily facing difficulties. We are daily facing, in many ways, dangers in our lives. When we think of our brothers and sisters who are suffering uh, for the cause of Jesus Christ, the Christians who are daily facing persecution, deprivation and death in many parts of the world, Jesus loves his own who are in the world. The Christians who are under the greatest pressure, he loves in a special way. Not in a greater way because he cannot, but it's a special way. He doesn't need to protect the ones that are in glory. He doesn't need to protect the ones who are not yet born. The ones who need his compassion and care and, uh, and encouragement are his own who are in the world. You know, uh, I'm, I'm a father of, um, of uh, three children, two, two boys and, and one girl. And, you know, I've never had a a, a child go off to to war, but there are many many families where one of the children goes off to war, and while that child is away, that mother has a special love for that child who is wherever in the world. She still loves the two at home. She still loves the two who are safe in the family home. The father still loves the two that are home. But there is a special love for the one who is in a distant land. Is he safe? Is he okay? And I'm sure every night there is a worry about that one that you don't need to worry about the other two. Now we know that God doesn't worry, so don't take the analogy too far. But I'm just saying that even as human beings, we have a, a special love for that one that in a, in a, in a more extreme way is in the world and in danger and in difficulty. It's a special love. It's no greater. It's no stronger. It's just different. Because you have two who are safe and you have one who isn't. And in a much greater sense, Jesus has a special love for his own who are in the world. We're in the world, we are in the world. Because we're not yet home and safe. We're on the way. We're on the way. It's a great life. He who began a good work in us will complete it at the day of Jesus' kings. But in all honesty, we don't know what lies ahead next year, the year after, sometimes not even next month. Especially in this church. There's so many people don't even know what they'll be doing after summer. But so many of us do not have the security of the people of this land. Wonder where I'll be in a year's time. Once I'll be able to stay. Once I can get that job. And Jesus understands. God understands. Because he loves his own who are in the world. He loves them with that special love. The Bible describes us as 
casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I remember as a new Christian, I, I, I got a little one of these little texts that you put in your Bible, and, and it was that one. I, I think it was 1 Peter 5 7, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, it is 1, 1, 1 Peter 5 7. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Sometimes we can feel disappointed with ourselves because we, we carry this burden of guilt and sin even though we know we belong to Jesus. As I said, you know, if you feel that you carry a, a, a real burden of, uh, of guilt, then, uh, you know, you have joined my club. I was born with guilt, I think. And uh, I think every one of us, we, we know something of that burden of guilt and sin. Even though we know the Lord Jesus Christ, even though we love the Lord Jesus Christ, even though that we are greatly loved by him, he calls us his beloved. Sometimes we're disappointed with ourselves. Sometimes we're disappointed with others. Sometimes we, we carry that disappointment with us. But Jesus still loves us. He loves his own who were in the world. Jesus loved his own who were in the world while he was here on the earth. And he loves his own who are in the world still, even though he is now in heaven. How does Jesus show his special love to us who are in this world? How did Jesus show his love to those who were in the world when he was here on earth? He chose them in his love. He called them by his love. And having chosen them and called them, he never left them, he never forsook them. Although Christ showed love, compassion and mercy to all, wherever he went, the four Gospels relate time and time again how Christ showed love, compassion, mercy, healing, deliverance, wherever he went to, wherever he could find people in need. But in spite of all that, he had a special love for 12 men. And for his friends, it was wider. For Mary and Martha, and Lazarus. And well, he had this, he had this, you could say it, it, it was just the people that he had that special love for. But probably no more, none more than for his disciples. His own who were in the world. Because he chose them, he called them, and he never left them, and he never forsook them. He taught them and cared for them and never gave up on them. Even when they were slow to learn. Even when he had to say, how long must I be with you? Sir? He would see me as seen the Father. Have you not understood yet, disciples? But it was always to build them up. His discipline was for their good, not his good. His teaching was for their good, not his good. His, his love and teaching and discipline was that he knew he was going to depart from this world and then they would be here to carry on the work. His own who were in the world. Oh, and he showed that compassion in a very special way, that mercy in a very special way, wherever he went. He sought no other company than their company. And I, I tell you that you might not feel very important in this world you might not feel as important as the leader of your company, of your country, whether it's a president or a king or a queen, but I tell you what. He has a love for you that is special. And he doesn't seek their company unless they are his own. He seeks your company. He doesn't seek the company of kings and queens. He didn't do that when he was on the earth and he doesn't do it now. He seeks the company of his own. And he seeks no other company than the company of his own. Which puts a, an accountability and a responsibility on us. Because if he seeks no other company than our own, how receptive are we? How much is our life on the order for God? How much obedience do we want to give to the one who seeks no other company than our own? How much submission 
Do we as men and women of the Lord Jesus give to the one who seeks no other company than his, than, 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 than his own, but which is us, and who loves his own, who are in the world, and he loves us to the end. Christ's love is greater than our unbelief. It's greater than our unfaithfulness. He's there to meet our needs. He's there to lift us up. He's there to help us, to guide us, to lead us to victory. And through life, until the end when we're face to face with the Lord and we hear those wonderful words, well done, you could and save us. Enter into the joy of heaven. Enter into the joy of what is waiting for us. And when the storm raged on the sea, Christ calmly. When the disciples were terrified, Christ comforted them. He once came walking on the water and they thought it was a ghost and he said, Sin, it is God. He sought no other company. And he cared and loved and healed and comforted and encouraged his disciples. That's why the New Testament is such a wonderful book because when we see what these disciples did, including the wonderful Apostle Paul, we see great encouragement. When you read John's letters about love, when you read Paul's letters about faith and justification by faith and the great doctrines that that Paul taught, they are for our encouragement, for our help. It's because God loves us that the Holy Spirit drove these men to write such words. They're too high, they're too mighty, they're too wonderful. And yet, they're for us, and they are true. The New Testament is a wonderful book, showing the love of God to his own who are in the world. Storms in our life, Christ will calm them. When Lazarus had been in the grave four days, Jesus raised him, proving that he is the resurrection and the life. Jesus taught them, he cared for them, and he never gave up on them. It's wonderful. And as I've already said, when Jesus rebuked and disciplined his disciples, it was always because he loved them and he cared for them and they needed it if they were ever to be able to stand and teach and preach in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. These men whose flesh failed them, these men who run away when Jesus was arrested, would very, very soon say, we must obey God rather than men who would soon be giving their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Generally considered, certainly ten, but probably eleven of the disciples, not Judas Iscariot, but uh, eleven of the, of, of the apostles gave their life to Jesus Christ. Paul gave his life to Jesus Christ. And the one who didn't, John, was exiled in, on the island of Patmos. Who cares? He knew what lay ahead for those disciples. He knew it wasn't going to be easy. He knew that they would wonderfully, willingly give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even those that weren't his disciples, but were his his own in the world, like Stephen, being stoned and instead of feeling the pain and and, and, and showing anger and and, and, and bitterness, he said, Lord, don't, don't bring this to their account. Ah, I see heaven open. Oh, I see heaven. I'm now going to what I've been called for. He loves his own who are in the world and he loves them to the end. As we've been studying on Fridays and Sundays, Christ came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He comforts us in our need. And he gives his life for our need. Because without his death, we are lost. Without his death, we are entering hell. But with his death and with his blood, we enter heaven. He comforts us. Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus loves his own who were in the world and he loves them to the end. 
He loves you to the end. He loves me to the end. The love of Christ to you is faithful, unflinching and unfailing. We have nothing to compare it with. When we look at the love of great men, when we look at the sacrifice of great men, we are often in awed by it. But compared to the love of Christ, we just are not on that level. The promise is, he loved us to the end, and one day we will see him and we will know him as he knows us. We will see him face to face, we will worship him, but we will, we will know him. We will understand all mysteries, all questions, every theological debate, and every, every doctrinal, tiny, little, nitty-gritty thing that I think is so important. We will know. Because he loves us. And we will be loved. We cannot even understand what it is like to be in Christ. We are imitators of Christ. We want to be conformed to Christ. But in all honesty, we will only really know him when we see him face to face. But fear not, because he loves you to the end. He loves us, not just the end of our life, which is wonderful because he will not let you go. He will not let me go. We might sometimes fall and fail and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, we, we make our mistakes, but he will not let you go. And I don't care how far you fall from him, you're still his and he'll still pull you back. And he will not let you go. Some of us have had those seasons. Some of you haven't yet. But he will not let you go. You can say with the, you know, the world, they use this saying, I'll be back. You will be back. Because he will not let you go. He will make you feel uncomfortable. He will, he, please do not get that far. Because I tell you what, he will turn your situation, he'll turn your life to be very, very uncomfortable. He will make things happen. He will, he will do what he can until you are restored. Not because he wants to make life difficult for you, but because he simply cannot bear to let you go. Because his blood was shed for you. His life was given for you. And when we come back, he doesn't keep reminding us of all our faults and failings. He just receives us with that same love. It can never be any less, no matter how unfaithful we are. It's not just to the end of that life, though. It's the, the utmost extent, absolutely, perfectly, and in the most terrible of circumstances. He loves us to the end. Even to the end of his own sufferings and death on the cross. He had always loved them. But now in his own sufferings, Christ shows his love to be supreme. He shows that this love from God, this love of God, is absolute. Not even suffering, not even death, not even mocking, not even scourging, not even terrible physical pain could touch the love of Christ towards us. So it's not just to the end of our life, but it's to the absolute, uttermost ends of the earth. And even when he was on the cross, he said some most amazing things like, Father, forgive them, so they know not what they do. Even on the cross, his love was to others. Father, forgive them. They're mocking me. They're scourging me. They hate me, but Father, forgive them, because they simply do not know what they are doing. And we did not know what we were doing until God sent his love into our lives to arrest us and transform us and change us, not just for this life, but for all eternity. He loved them to the end. He turned to the thief on the cross and he said, Today you will be with me in paradise. To a man who couldn't promise anything, couldn't promise to spend the rest of his life serving the Lord because he didn't have any life left. Couldn't promise to be a pastor or a preacher or a missionary or you know, these promises when we were in trouble. All he could say was, 
Lord, remember me when you come into the kingdom. The day you will be with me in paradise. His love is supreme. With his own sufferings and death a few hours away, Jesus spends these last moments in words and deeds of love towards his own disciples. Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And do you really think that Jesus, who loved them so greatly, when his own sufferings were moments away, could forget them when he was resurrected and restored to the glory of heaven? If Jesus hanging on the cross, dying in absolute agony, and with so much mocking him, and terrible things being said about him, that would have brought any man, any one of us, to curse but he loved them to the end and forgave and he, he, he restored a, 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 a thief on the cross. He loved those that were crucifying him. And, and now he's in heaven. Do you think he would then forget his disciples? If he didn't forget them when his own death is just, just hours away, if he didn't forget them when he's hanging on the cross in absolute agony, he will not forget them in glory. And he will not forget us in glory. He's in glory now. No, this Jesus who loved at the very point of his own agony and suffering, could never forget you. And he could never forget me. We are engraved in the palms of his hands, it says in Isaiah. Not just stamped, but engraved in the palms of his hands. Christ's love will never cease, never fail, and never leave you. And what a wonderful truth this is when we look at what we are. I am stunned. I am in, in awe when I look at what he does to who I am. When we think of our sins and our failure and our pride and our blackness and our sinfulness and vileness, we're, we're humbled by wonder and gratitude at the love of God in Christ. How is it possible that Christ's love is never exhausted never forsakes us, never leaves us. How can Christ say, I will never leave you nor forsake you when we are so selfish and so sinful and so proud? It's simply so. It simply cannot be any different. Because he cannot love any less or any more. It is simply absolute. Let the mystery remain with us as we humbly submit to his lordship. It has to be a mystery. How can the Holy One of God love such a one as you and I with that love? That he can love us? Yes, I can understand that. That he can have great love for us? I can understand that. But the fact that it is absolute, it's too high. Do you know the, the word of God says in this same section as he is teaching his disciples, it says, as the Father has loved you, so as the Father has loved me, so I love you. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. With the same love that the Father has loved me, so I, I, I love you. And with the same love that Jesus has for the Father. The Father's love is the same for us as it is with his Son. The Son's love is the same for us as it is with the Father. Now we're into mysteries that I have absolutely no explanation. When I first heard in, in, in a sermon that, that, that the Father loves us with the same love he, lo he has for his Son, and that Jesus loves us with the same love, that's, the, that's the, exactly the same agape love that he has for the Father. I thought it was blasphemy. It was only that I was actually given the, the, the text in John, and I read it for myself, and I was amazed, I was humbled, that he, the Father, loves you with the same love he loves the Son. This is when it just becomes a mystery. This is when we, we, we cannot understand it anymore. We just have to just rejoice in it and not explain it and be honest with ourselves that how can anyone explain 
that God loves us as much as he loves Jesus, and Jesus loves us as much as he loves the Father. If you think it's blasphemy, I did as well, but I'll show you the verses in John's Gospel if, if uh, you think it's... It, it is too high. It is too much. It does smack of blasphemy. But that's the love of Christ. That's the love of the Father. That's the love of God. We're bought with a price. And that price is love. It was love that bound Christ to the cross. It was love that flowed from the body of Christ on the cross. A crimson tide of blood shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I know you sometimes despair of your own sin. I know I do. And our failure and our doubt. Does Christ really love me? Does God really love me? But Jesus truly will love you to the end, just as he has always loved you. You see, he didn't love you at the beginning of your life. He didn't love you as you were first seeing the light of day on this earth. He loved you before the very foundation of the world. He chose you, he loved you, he poured his love on you from the before the foundation of the world. And we know he's from everlasting to everlasting. So you are everlastingly loved. We have a beginning because we're created, but we have no end. And Christ will love us throughout all eternity. The Father will love us throughout all eternity. And we need this new resurrected body, but when we get it, we will love him throughout all eternity. And we won't be bothered by, by sin and, and unfaithfulness and discouragement and, and, and despair that affects our love for God. We will just love him throughout all eternity. We're not dealing with an inconsistent saviour who loves us today and departs and rejects us tomorrow. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. But if Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, and he loves them to the end, then we need to persevere in his love. We need to remain in his love. We need to continue in his love. Live a life of obedience and submission to the Lord. We were speaking about this before uh, in the small group Bible study. That in all honesty, the more you know the love of God, the more you know the grace of God, the more you know that you're an undeserved sinner saved by grace, the more you know that you live by grace, the more you know that it's purely by grace, not our works, not our merit, nothing we can do, do can add to it. Instead of this, this accusation we often get that, oh, well, you believe you can, we can sin and sin and, and, and God will forgive us. Paul gives the answer. I don't need to. God forbid. God forbid. The more you know the love of Christ, the more you will submit to his lordship. The more you know the love of Christ, the more you will obey him in everything you can possibly do. The more you know the love of God, the more hours of the day you will be thinking of him. You will be loving him. You will just be in, in absolute gratitude to him. So I think really the, the, the way that we love God, the amount that we love God, the amount that we obey and submit to God, I think is very, very uh, is measured really in how much we know the love of God. The more you know the love of God, the more you know the grace of God, the more you want your life on earth. Because it is, it is incredible how much he loves us. So continue in his love. You who come Friday, Sunday at 2 and 4.30 and then spend your best time in prayer, Bible reading, and you know the, the readings of godly men and women, continue in that love. Continue to love him to the end. Never lose that first love because he has never lost his first love to you. We've been looking at the wonderful love of Jesus who, having loved his own, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. But what about those who are not his own? Are you religious or are you born again? Are you relying on your denomination or your church background? Are you relying on good works? You're either his own or you're not his own. 
I was saved in an evangelical free church. Doesn't get much better than that. No? <laughs> Good old evangelical free church. I spent many years in, in the Pentecostal church. Doesn't help me one iota. I'm either his own or I'm not. And when I face to face before Jesus, well, I went to an evangelical free church and we have the best doctrine in the world. Won't help me one iota. If I go there and I say, well, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've got more gifts than the rest is well put together. Won't help me one iota. I'm either his own or I'm not his own. And how am I? I've repented of my sin. I know I'm a dreadful, awful, vile sin. But I've received his forgiveness of my sins. And I know that he's my saviour. I know he died on the cross for me. I know he's the only way to God. And I know that he has chosen me to go that way. And I have willingly gone that way with him. But what about you? Are you his own? Are you religious or are you born again? There are no more terrible words than these without Christ. To die without Christ. There are no worse words than that. Some of us have no real interest in commitment. You enjoy meeting your friends and the social side of the church is, is really good and, and that, that's one of our, our real strengths at TIC. But you're still without Christ. Words such as holiness and commitment and submission and surrender have no meaning to you. They have no place in your life. You've no real interest in placing all your trust in Jesus only. You've no understanding of what it means to be saved by grace, through faith, without works, without effort, without merit. And you are still dead in your sins without Christ and without hope in this world. Unless you become his own. Repent of your sins. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Believe that he died for you. And receive him as your Lord and Saviour. And you are his own. Because one day we will all have to appear before Christ for judgment. There will be no TIC to help me. You won't be able to help me. You won't be able to say, well, Pastor Rob, he, he really did do his best. And uh, you know, I, I really think he was a nice man. He won't help me. I'll have to face the Lord Jesus. I'll have to face God alone, as everybody else will. And I will either hear that I'm his own or not. But the wonderful thing is when you are his own, you have that assurance of salvation. So one day we will all have to appear before Christ, but there is still hope. For Jesus is the friend of sinners. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you a so you know, if you're his own, then just rejoice this evening. You know, rejoice over coffee. Rejoice when you go home tonight. Rejoice as you lay your head on your pillow. You know, uh, you might have problems. You might not know where you're going to be after summer. You might not know whether you're going to be allowed to stay in Norway or whether you're going to have to go to the next next country. But he's with you to the end. And rejoice in that. But if not, then just come to Jesus. Because you're laboring and you're heavy laden and he wants to give you rest. Come and be his own. But Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Father, we just thank you for your love. Lord, we just don't deserve it. We cannot earn it. We cannot merit it. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. Oh, we thank you for the cross. We are dreadful sinners without you, Lord. Not one of us is worthy. Not one of us could ever come near your presence. But Lord, you made a way. We thank you for the cross. We thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for our sins. We receive that forgiveness now. We thank you, Lord, that we are your own. To the very end. Amen.